Okay, questions? Anything you want repeated before the midterm? Any questions you are having difficulty understanding? Which one? Okay, so you were given the potential 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 p dot r over r cube and you were required to calculate the electric field It should be something like this I might be missing some factors somewhere. Yeah. The question? What is the electric field that we found? We were supposed to like account. I couldn't get this equation out of that. This one? Yeah. Why not? I don't know. I some of them are like using the like a kind of questions or something. You see, the reason why I gave you this expression was that it's not so easy to derive it from this V. But starting from V, you can calculate the electric field. It was the derivative of V with respect to X in the X direction, derivative of V with respect to Y in the Y direction, minus the derivative of V with respect to Z in the Z direction. This is the electric field. And then you can calculate each one of the components using this expression. And you can compare it with the components of this expression. So, and you, 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 you should be able to show that these two vectors have the same components. Now, if two vectors have the same components, they are equal. Okay, let's start with one component. Which component do you like? Hmm? X, okay. So EX, if we derive it, this is minus dV by dX. And we were also given that the electric field, uh, the dipole moment is in the z direction. This was also given, right? So the, there, the potential is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, z over r cube. This is equal to minus z over 4 pi epsilon 0. This doesn't depend on z. Derivative with respect to r of 1 over r cubed times the derivative of r with respect to x. z, the z component, the direction of the dipole moment. And this is equal to minus z over 4 pi epsilon 0. The, this derivative is minus 3 over r to the 4 times dr by dx. Uh, I'm probably missing, this should be squared. This is squared. No? Okay, cube. If you insist. Well, dr by dx, we had already derived it, that was x over r. So this is equal to 3z times x over 4 pi epsilon 0 r to the fifth. This is ex. That we calculate from the potential. Now let's look at this expression over here. This one. Now 
Now the x component of this one, let's say this is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. This is z. The x component of r hat is nothing but x over r. And p doesn't have an x component. So we have 1 over r cubed. So this is xz over 4 pi epsilon 0 r cubed. R to the 4. Now, they don't agree. Probably I'm missing some factors. I mean, either this wasn't R to the 3 or this is R to the 4 or I don't know. What I found was that, as you said, it was given that P was equal to PZ, and I thought that I put a big dipole like this, and I put this hypothetical R distance. I said that um, the, the magnitude of the scalar product is p, p dot r must be p times whatever the r is times cosine, cosine theta. And there was this derivation that came out in which depended on cosine. Okay. Well, I couldn't get this out of that. Now, the problem is you have to calculate the derivative of theta with respect to x. That wouldn't be easy. You can, but theta depends on x. Anyway, about these vectors. Now, you have been complaining about vectors last semester in 109, and some of you are still asking me what you can do with, uh, to avoid vectors. It is not something you can avoid. I mean, you will be using vectors more and more in the future years. And you have already a feeling that last semester we didn't use vectors that much. All of this semester we will be using vectors. So if you don't feel comfortable with vectors, you, you should better review vectors. OK, let's start our current. Now, up to now, we had always been dealing with statics. So whatever we said up to now are valid in statics. We will see that some of them will still be valid when we consider charges that are in motion but some of them we will need to modify them. Now, we had already seen that, in fact, one example where we had, if you remember, we, had, we were discussing these capacitors. We had these two capacitors. One was initially charged with a charge Q1, and then we connected them. And then we just allowed the charges to just flow through the, the system until it reached electrostatics. And then we could just use whatever we learned before. Now, we will be starting to deal with how does this capacitor charge the other one? That is something we will be discussing, not in this chapter, but in the next chapter. But this chapter, we will be discussing the current in general. Now, current we will, is what we, uh, the, it's just the motion of the charges, the flow of charges. Well, we will be more specific than this. So we will be, we will be dealing with metallic conductors from now on. Whenever we say a, a conductor, we will mean a metallic conductor unless we specify that it is something else. So what happens? Now, we had already, in fact, seen, discussed to some extent the, the current when we were discussing what happens if we just bring some charge nearby. Look, let's say we have a conductor over here. We bring a positive charge over here. Now what happens? You see the conductor is a system in which the charges are free to move. Since we are dealing with metals, we know that the electrons are free to move. So when we bring this positive charge here, well, it will attract the negative charges. So they are free to move. They will move towards the positive charge and the remaining, so basically the, an electron over here, it will just move towards the positive charge. This is what we will be calling the current. Now, of course, eventually it will stop. Now, why? Because as the charges are built here, there will be negative charges on, this, uh, on one side and positive charges will be left on the other side. And this 
the negative charges here and positive charges here will create an additional electric field. They will exert an additional force to the electrons in, inside my conductor. And when the charges on the left and the right surfaces, they are large enough so that they exert a large enough force on the electrons here, they will just stop. The total force will be zero acting on the electrons in this region, so the electrons will start stop moving. Now the question is, what happens if as the electrons are moving here, we don't allow them to accumulate over there, but we just move them to the other side. We just pick these electrons and keep moving them to the other side. So that statics will never be reached, so the electrons will keep moving. So now, and the device that does that for you basically takes away the electrons on one side and give away the electrons on the other side is what we call a battery. So if you have any conductor, you're connected to a battery. This is our battery. Plus side and the negative side, positive terminal and the negative terminal. So what this does is it will take electrons from the positive terminal and put it on the negative terminal. It will give electrons from the negative terminal. This is what the battery does. So there's a constant flow of electrons. Now the first question, why do the electrons flow? So there's a force, there's a potential difference, there's an there's a electric field in the conductor. So battery basically builds up an electric field in the conductor. Now before we said that there's no electric field in the conductor, but I was always trying to stress that in electrostatics, there is no electric field in a conductor. But when we start to have currents, when we are away from statics, we can have electric fields in the conductor. And basically, this is what the battery does. Battery creates an electric field in the conductor. And so the electrons start moving through the circuit. Now, there are two kinds of motion that you have to distinguish of an electron. If you take any metal, any conductor, any system, the electrons are moving very fast. So the average, the, if you take, consider one electron, the electron will be moving in zigzag motion in arbitrary directions. Now it will move in one direction, then collide with some atom, then it will move to another direction, and then move for some time, collide with some other atom, and it will just make this zigzag motion. And its speed is typically of the order of 10 to the power 6 meters per second. Just a typical number. But you see, if you count the number of electrons that goes through, let's say, such an area, you just consider this area and count the electrons that are moving from one side to the other side. This is one electron. There will be many electrons. And if you just consider this area, there will be as many electrons to be, that move in one direction as there are that moves on the other direction. So the net number of, in the absence of an electric field. So we have zero electric field. The electrons are moving at, 10 to, at speeds of the order of 10 to the power 6 meters per second. But they are just moving randomly. So they're not going anywhere. And if you just take, consider such an area, there, there is no electron passing through this area. The net number of electrons that pass through this area, or the flux of electrons, so to speak, through this area is just zero. Now, what happens when you apply an electric field? So this is the zigzag motion of an electron in the absence of an electric field, let's say there is an electric field now in this direction. But the electron, you see, it goes from here to there in, under the influence of zero average net force, let's say. But now there is an electric field so which will push it, which will curve the path through the left, to, towards the left, because there will be a force acting on the electrons towards the left. So this, that electron, rather than moving straight, it will just move like this and eventually it will collide with something and it will scatter back. Well, you see, after the scattering, it moves in this direction. 
So now it will move in, let's say, in the same direction, but now it will be slowing down as it moves. And when it collides, it will be moving along this direction, but again, due to the electric field, it will be bent. And it will keep making this zigzag, but it will slowly move to one side. Okay. If you just consider the average position of the electron, well, the exact position of the electron, it has a speed 10 to the power 6 meters per second. But if you just consider some kind of an average position, it will slowly move. And that's what we call the drift velocity. The drift velocity is some typ typical values is of the order of 10 to the power 6 meters per second. So the electron will slowly move in one side, but this slow motion is really slow. And 10 to the power minus 6 meters per second is like one thousandth of a millimeter per second. Per hour, one or two millimeters per hour. That is the velocity of the electrons. Well, there are various factors that will influence this. Uh, of course, since it's moving already very fast, a small acceleration doesn't really change its displacement that much. It's, made, it's, it's probably due to the speed, the large speed. Now, then the question is, let's see. So if you consider the distance, let's say, from here to the lights over there, that's like 20 meters, right? Let's say, of the order of 10 meters. So how long does it take for the electron to reach there if it has a drift velocity of 10 to the power of minus 6 meters per second? A lot. Definitely not during the lecture hour. But then how come the light goes off almost immediately? if the electrons are not moving there. And you see, the moment that I click this button, the lights are off. So this is the question. The electrons, okay, they are moving very fast. Typically of the speeds of 10 to the power 6 meters per second. But they are just moving randomly, and they are constantly making collisions. Between two collisions, the distance between this point and this point is not even one millimeter. So in a very small region, of region, the electron is just moving back and forth. So on the average, it doesn't move. So I just imagine yourself, you are always moving left and right. But during the class time, you are not moving. You are fixed in your seat. It's just like that. The electrons are just moving back and forth. There's no displacement. But then there's something that is pushing them as they are moving, the electric field. The electric field keeps pushing them in one direction, let's say this direction. So as the electrons are moving back and forth, <coughs> constantly scattering, well, there's a slightly larger probability that they will scatter in this direction or they will be accelerating in that direction. So they have a small tendency to move in that direction. So they just move like this. Just imagine small chicks, you just want to push them, go out of the door, but they are just randomly running around. You can just guide them to the door, although they will still be randomly running around. That's what the electrons does. And the so-called drift velocity, the drift speed of the electrons is of the order, is very small. So they will not be, I mean, when I click this button, the electrons will not go there. But I know that when I click that button, the light is turned on or off, almost instantaneously. So the question is, why? What causes the light over there to be turned on and off? Well, did we describe the electrons as a pendulum? No, not really. 
I mean, you see, the distances between the electrons are huge compared to their sizes. If you imagine one atom, the atom is 99.999% empty. So it is as if, if you are an electron sitting over there, the next electron will probably out of campus, if you're considering your size. So you can, the electrons cannot really push each other. Why? The electric field. You see, the electric field, that is what moves instantaneously. It's not the electrons. So the, ele the moment that I press this button, almost instantaneously there is an electric field in the wire. And that electric field everywhere in the wire. And that electron field kind of pushes all the electrons together, including the one over here, the one very close to the lamp, etc. So that is why when I click on this button, the light over there turns on almost instantaneously. <coughs> now the electrons are moving slowly. All the electrons are moving very slowly. But just imagine this one. I am pushing, let's say I'm trying to push you. In your model, if I'm trying to push you, I push him and you push your friend next, uh, behind you, and you push the, <coughs> the friend behind you. So it will take a long time for the, this push. Since there are so many spaces, it will take a long time for this push to go to the, back of the, uh, to the back of the classroom. But what happens is the electric field, when I push that switch, is turned on instantaneously. So you feel a push if you are an electron, and your friend on the back also feels a push at the same time. So you're all moving together. Is, that, is it that electrons attract each other one by one? Because it, there's a line by being pushing the next one, pushing the next one. Does it go like that way, or the thing in the? No, you see, if 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 that model was true, you see, you are pushing him, but he, he is pushing her, and she is pushing him. So she will he will not move. Your forces balance each other. Epsilon will be different, but that's, that's for sure. But that's not the effect. I mean, if you just consider the pushes of the electrons, you see, without this external electric field, there is no net motion. That basically means that there is no net force on the average acting on anything. So the net force is already zero. So your push on him is balanced by her push on him. So it's only the external field which breaks this balance and hence it causes all the electrons to move. It's, and this motion, I mean, it's not that I am pushing him, he is pushing him, he is pushing him. The electric field is everywhere instantaneously. So he feels a push at the same instant the other, his, the other electron feels a push at the same instant the other electron feels a push. Everywhere at almost at the same time. Good question. Why not? Why? Did you say why not? Yeah. <laughs> nice question. Why does it prefer to go in the metal? Yeah. I thought that it was because of the environment first. And if, if that was the wrong question, I thought that the induction <laughs> Let me ask this question first. Is it only in the conductor? The electric field? It, it is not, but obviously in the conductor, uh, it was more easy than the much more. Well, I mean, electrons cannot leave the metal. The metal is holding the, uh, the electrons inside, in the, in the ball. So there is on the sur when the electron reaches the surface, the whole system as a whole exerts a large force on the system because if you just consider one electron out of the metal, the metal will be charged, the electron is charged, there is no, no balancing forces acting on anything, so there will be a strong attraction. So the metal will not let the electrons leave the metal unless you exert a huge electric field. If you exert a huge electric field, there is nothing preventing the electron from leaving the metal. But the battery will not be exerting such a large electric field. 
we know that electric field is uh, right here, and then it's created by a source. Okay. Say, and then how do we manipulate through the wire that electric field to uh, they move along the wire, not outside? I mean, if you say there's a random wire and it's always along the wire. Yes, this is our wire. We have a metal. We have an electron over here. There's no battery. And this electron will just move randomly from time to time. It will just hit the boundary. Now, what will happen if it hits the boundary? It will leave. It will try to leave, let's say. But if it leaves, if it leaves the metal, the metal becomes positively charged. The electron is negatively charged. So the force between them will be huge. So it will just pull the electron backwards. So it cannot leave the metal. This is the force exerted by the metal itself. In a sense, you can consider the metal as kind of a potential well. This is your metal. This is your pot electron, the potential that the electron feels. So the electron, if it has this energy, it cannot leave. If it tries to leave, there will be other attractive forces. This is due to the metal, due to the properties of the metal itself. Then we apply an external electric field. By connecting it to a battery. Now, this force keeping the electrons inside, it's only on the boundaries. There is no force acting on the electron inside. The net force will be zero on the average. But now, once we connect it to a battery which creates an electric field. Now there is an electric field in the conductor. From the positive side to the negative side. So this is the electric field created by the battery which creates a force acting on the electron. Now this force, let's say if you, let's just imagine that you exert an electric field upward direction, let's say. Unless the electric field is huge, it will not be able to overcome this barrier. It will not be able to go out of the potential. Just imagine it. This whole thing is like a valley. This, I mean, you can try to push the electrons out of the valley, but they have to climb a high hill, and it won't be easy. It is possible if you exert a sufficiently large electric field, but. A, s a small battery that you use in this thing will not do it. Now, the electric field, sorry, don't forget the electric field, by the way, although I'm only drawing these ones, these are not the only electric field lines. There are other electric field lines. These are all additional electric field lines. They will be there. They have to be there. Because now, in a moment, we will be calculating the potential difference between these two points. And the potential difference between those two points should be the same whether I evaluate it along this line or along this line. It should be the same. And that tells us that there have to be electric field lines outside also. They're everywhere. Well, they are not always along the wire. They always, they sometimes leave the wire. Well, well, I will give a kind of a short answer. Just like most of you, just like any one of you, us, the electric field lines also try to go, they tend to go along the easy way. And the conductors make an easy way for them to go. You see, if they don't go along the wire, let's imagine we have this conductor and we connect it to a battery. <coughs> and we apply an external electric field, an additional one. 
besides the one exerted by the battery. So if we apply such an electric field, what will happen is the electrons, they will move to the lower edge. <coughs> the upper edge will be positively charged until the electrons inside will feel a force only in the horizontal direction. So again, the electric field inside the metal will be from this point to that point. So if you bend it, this is actually what also happens there. So what, what, what about the magnitude? The magnitude of what? I mean, you see, the accumulation of charges at, these, at the surface will continue as long as the net electric field inside has a vertical component. And it will stop, the accumulation will stop when there is no vertical component of the electric field but only the <coughs> horizontal component. So the electric field will be horizontal inside the metal. Along, it will be along the metal. Almost instantaneously, yes. Okay, why almost instantaneously? Well, that is, that is the kind of the easy part to answer. Wait two more months. We will see that the electric field, the changes in the electric field move at the speed of light. So it's not instantaneous, but it's almost in instantaneous. Now, why do we have electric fields everywhere, also outside the wire? because the, the potential difference should be independent of the path. So if we calculate the potential difference between these two points along this line inside the metal or along a path that goes out of the metal, it should be the same. For them to be the same, you have to have electric field lines outside. So the, in that, because of that, the electric field lines are everywhere. But you see, if you just look at this picture, forget about this conductor over here. It's just like a parallel plate capacitor. And the parallel plate capacitor have these fringing fields, which are everywhere. They have a small magnitude, but they do exist. And these are just like the fringing effects. Well, what a battery does is it doesn't create the electric field. What it does is it just takes away electrons from one terminal and gives away electrons on the other terminal. And hence, if you connect it to a, such a system, what it does is it's constantly taking away electrons and giving away electrons from one region to the other one. So it's moving electrons from one side to the other side. So the electrons are constantly moving. To keep the electron constantly moving, you have to have an electric field. I don't say any magnetic thing. I mean, the only thing we are discussing yet is the electric field. We will be only dealing with currents. We will come to the magnetic field later on. There will be some other effects of having moving charges. But for the time being, let's just restrict ourselves to the electric field. Let me define the current. What do we mean by the current and continue with your questions? Now, the definition of the current is, let's say we have this battery connected to something. And we had seen that the electrons will have a drift velocity since we're connected to a battery. So if you consider such an area, let's say A, then you can count the time and count the charge that passes through the area. So this is... Delta Q is the charge that passes <coughs> through area in delta T time. Then we define the current as delta Q over delta T. This is how we define the current. So 
you take this, you take an arbitrary area, and then you just count how many charges pass through it, and divide it by the time it takes for those uh, charges to pass through it, and this ratio is what we call the current. Now, we, we are not doing electrostatics, so nothing is static, but nevertheless, we will be dealing with, dealing with systems, stationary systems. Now, what we mean by stationary is that it is not necessarily static, but the system doesn't change in time. Now, for the time being, we will again restrict ourselves to stationary systems, systems that can be moving, but it's just they will not change in time. What that means is that, let's say, and what we were saying for the, the battery, it gives one electron and take, it takes away one electron, gives one electron. So the electron number doesn't change. So if there is one electron passing through this point, there will be another electron replacing it. So if one electron moves from this point to this point, another electron will come from here and it will come to this point. So if you consider the charge density at any point on your conductor, it will be constant. It will not change in time. It will be stationary. So those are the systems that we are dealing with. Now, if you have a stationary system, whether you take this area or whether you consider this area, nothing will change. The current that you evaluate will be the same. Mainly because since our system is stationary, it shouldn't be changing in time. The total number of electrons in this volume should not be changing in time. But that means whatever electron passes through this area from this point to this point, from this point to this point, the same number of electrons should pass from this point to this point. If the number of electrons that pass from this point to this point is the same as the number of electrons passing through this area, if delta Qs are the same in a given delta T, so the current passing through this area and the current passing through the other area will be the same. So this area that we are considering is not important. Whatever area you imagine, along this circuit, even in this one, a double prime, the current will always be the same. The current doesn't change. The current at this point, the current at this point, the current at this point, they are all equal. I repeat, if our system is stationary. Well, you see, in this expression, where is the area that I should take the sinus of? There is none. It will come in a moment. Uh, for the time being, we will be sticking with one inertial frame in the sense that we have the battery at rest, we have the wires at rest, we have this, we will say, the, the, the circuit equipment, the, everything will be at rest. Well, relative to which reference point, whichever one you like, but we are studying the system in that reference point. Now, what will it look like in a different reference point? Uh, it will be an important question that we will be asking towards the end of the semester. Now we will study what happens if you go to another reference rate. Why does it take time to reach that state the same time? The stationary system. Stationary state, steady state. And it takes time. In order to reach the steady current, it takes some time. It takes time. We are, past, we are ignoring that time. We are assuming that, okay, we connect the, the system to the battery, we wait for some time. By the way, that time is at the order of milliseconds, nanoseconds. We wait for that long, and then we observe our system. Then we will, just like in the statics, I mean, we, even if we change our system in statics, we said that we study the system after it reaches statics. 
In this case, we study our system after it reaches this steady current or the stationary uh, configuration. How long does it take? We will study that. If, if electric field no, uh, does not exist. Okay, if there is no electric field. But uh, again, uh, can the current, current uh, follow in a conductor again? Without an electric field, can we have a current running through the conductor? Now the question is, <coughs> so we have these electrons moving, so they have an energy. They will be colliding with atoms. If they will be colliding with atoms, will they lose energy? If they lose energy, they will eventually stop. If they don't lose energy, then the current can just run flo flowing without us exerting any electric field. For example, although we will be mainly dealing with currents and metals, just imagine this. You have a, that is what we do in the LHC. You have a bunch of protons and you just send them. Even if you remove the electric field, the protons will keep moving. So if you consider an area, there will be a number of charges passing through that area in a given amount of time, although there is no electric field there. So there will be a current without an electric field. Now, in ordinary met uh, metals, if you send a current, if you don't, they will start losing energy. But if they lose energy, you have to give some energy. You have to give energy to the system to keep the current running. That's what the battery does creating an electric field. There are also superconductors, which, and we will come to superconductors later on. Now there's one thing about the current, we usually assign a direction to the current. And the direction of the current is the direction of the hypothetical positive charges. Now what does that mean, the hypothetical positive charges? Well, in a metal, we know that it's the electron that moves in the wire. So let's just imagine this area. And if you imagine one electron passing from here to the other side, what happens is this side, the charge of this side is lowered by one electron charge. And the charge of the other side is increased by one electron charge, one unit of charge. So it will be the same if there is a positively charged object would just move in this direction. So whether you have negative charges moving in this direction or positive charges moving in this direction, in terms of the charge contact of the content of your system, they are the same. If the negative charges are moving in this direction, you have the charge here is getting smaller and smaller. The charge here is getting larger and larger as numbers. But if the positive charges are moving in this direction, the charge here gets larger and larger, the charge here gets smaller and smaller. So they are the same. So that's why we always fix the direction of the current as the direction of the flow of real or hypothetical positive charges. So this is the direction of the current in this system. And it's the same everywhere. Is the electric field created by the electrons in the wire? I would say the electric field is created by the battery, by what the battery does. How is the direction or the shape of the electric field? In the wire. Well, if I would draw, this is the, my huge battery. This is my huge wire. Inside the wire, this will be the direction of the electric field lines. They will follow the conductor.
Why? Because of the reasons that I explained over there. So let's just imagine that we have one electric field line that is moving in this direction. But that electric field line will just push the electrons over here. It will push them inside. If it pushes them inside, there will be a positive charge here and a negative charge somewhere over here, which will create, no, if, okay, so this is, the electrons are moving over, yeah. But this means there's an additional electric field created, which will cancel the vertical component of the electric field line that is leaving this metal. So we can, we can say that this is an electric field. True, true. Inside the metal, of course, the electric field lines will mainly follow your wire. There might be some, just a few leaving the wire anyway. And there will be some other electric field lines out of the wire, but they are created already out of the wire. They have to be there because they of that the potential should be independent of the path. Okay, let's give a 10-minute break, and then we will continue.